Well, on behalf of MITAC, the MIT Activities Committee, we are excited to be joined by Graham McKay, um, the Executive Director and Master Boat Builder for Lowell's Boat Shop. And with that, Graham, I'll let you do the rest of the introduction yourself. Okay, am I alive? Yeah, let's see. Yep. Great, we're live. Hi, everybody. Um, I can't see you, but I, I hope you can see me, the wonders of modern technology. Um, I am coming to you from the office here at Lowell's Boat Shop, which is right up the street from where many of you are. We're in Amesbury, which is in the, um, the far northeast nub of the state. And um, I, I am a, uh, a homegrown kid, so I grew up just down the street here from the shop, and uh, I learned how to build boats here. I did attend... Uh, the other place across the way there in Cambridge for a little while until I, uh, before I came back here to, um, to build boats, which is obviously not a typical track. But um, what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna run you through a little history of the shop, which is quite long. So I'm gonna shorten it up a little and give you the overview. But what I would encourage you all to do is ask questions as I go along, uh, somewhat, unorthodox, I suppose, for a, a Zoom uh, presentation, but it helps me uh, tailor what I'm saying to what your interests are. So if at any point you have a question, um, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to sort of be out of the, uh, out of the hosting loop. But um, if you can either raise your hand or shout it out, that's fine. And I can uh, answer questions along the way. So uh, I'm about to share my screen here in a moment, and I'll run you through a little slideshow on our history. And then what I'm going to do is take you on a little walk around the shop to see what we're doing uh, even today. And if I go long enough, um, I, I should only go about an hour. We'll have um, a Q&A at the end so that we can answer more of your questions. Um, so without further ado, Try and make this work. Does that look good to everybody? Looks perfect. Like it's supposed to? All right. So Lowell's Bow Shop then and now. See, I can spell. How about that? Um, so I like to, to start by orienting you to where we are. Um, and where we are, as I said, is Amesbury, Massachusetts. People are forever looking for us in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is not the case. Um, so we are just upriver from Newburyport, which you may be more familiar with, but if you travel north and you go over the big 95 bridge before you hit New Hampshire, we are uh, visible from that bridge. And that bridge is actually on this map, uh, is right there. So we are in this little stretch over here. And, and I love to start with this 1776 chart of the river. Um, because it shows what a metropolis at the time Newbury was, um, later Newburyport. Uh, but it also shows that there was a lot going on in the part of Amesbury where we are. And this is a, a bit of a zoom in, in on that same chart. Um, and what it shows is in, in the deep water of the river, um, you've got a lot of structures built up and you've got a lot of wharves and things that are indicative of um, a lot of seagoing trade and commerce. Um, but what I really like about this slide is that it shows where Amesbury began. So um, this is Ferry Road in Newburyport. This is Amesbury Ferry. And then this was the main road north across the river. And so the ferry obviously went across here. And town was originally established um, right along the western bank of this river called the Powwow, a little tributary. Um, of the Merrimack River, which is the river that we are on. And so uh, when the Lowell's themselves came to town, they settled right along here. They built wharves, they had shipyards um, and such from the, really from the latter half of the 1600s um, up until the 1970s. Um, what were they doing along that river? They were building small schooners and fishing boats and things like this. 
Um, and the reason that I can show you a picture of this particular boat, um, which was built in Amesbury in, in 18, I think it was built in 1805, not 1806, but um, <clears throat> is that it survived long enough to be photographed. Um, and so it was such a well-built schooner that it uh, survived its entire life up until I think it was broken up in the 1920s somewhere. Um, so it didn't even wreck. It had to be retired and broken up. But uh, what it is, is a good pictorial example or photographic example of the types of ships that they were building right along the Powwow River there. Um, and the reason that they were building along the Powwow is it was deep water, it was tidal, but it was far enough upriver that it was uh, easily defended from, say, the British or even prior to the British, the French or any other uh, foreign power that may want to, you know, come up and burn your shipyards. Uh, it was also, it had access the, with all of, well, with the length of the Merrimack River, you had access to timber and shipbuilding lumber, you know, well up into New Hampshire. And so uh, you had all of the inputs directly at hand for building these boats, uh, you know, quickly and inexpensively. Um, and so in... 1793, Simeon Lowell, who'd been practicing as a boat builder, um, we believe somewhere here along the powwow, bought the property where we now exist over here, um, which at that time was already a shipyard with some outbuildings and, and things like that. And so uh, you can see that, that uh, Simeon is in the books as being a boat builder in Amesbury as early as, as 1774. At the time that he bought our current location, uh, this was actually, it had been Webster's Point and then became Salisbury Point uh, and then eventually became part of Amesbury. So really Simeon moved out of Amesbury over to Salisbury across this little river um, to where we are now today. And I, I show this map because, and forgive me, I, I change this presentation and I give it sporadically. So sometimes the, the slides are um, as much of a surprise to me as they are to you. But um, it's the only map that shows where we are currently as a shipyard and not a boat shop or a boathouse. Uh, and there are later maps here that show uh, us as a boathouse and, and several other boathouses along here. Um, but it just, it's proof that the main business prior to the middle part of the uh, 19th century, it was a shipyard. And I like to show this too, because I do uh, show this presentation to a lot of people in town who this town was built on the powwow over here. Uh, there's a falls up, up out of the picture here where there are a number of mill buildings. Um, this was a main thoroughfare for trade and, um, and shipbuilding and all that. And the town nowadays has no relationship with this river. And this is why I, uh, I have this next slide, which is a, <clears throat> an overview after the Eisenhower interstate highway system came through. And you can see the old river used to come up through here, come around, go back up through there, and then continue on up to town. And they all but filled in um, all of the old main historic parts of that river, redirected it um, and made it much smaller than it previously had been. So, um, you know, the town had really moved away from using that river long before and that was just the eventuality of, of that reality. Uh, here's a close up of that, that other, uh, that old map that I Oh, showing you showing D Lowell's shipyard. You can see a sizable boat on the stocks there. The other noticeable thing is that houses all old houses. And so uh, at the time that Simeon bought this property, this road did not exist. And really he was just buying the shoreside property with the house across the street. Um, and that was the case all the way up and down this whole stretch of the river. And it really was the case up until maybe 40 or 50 years ago that the houses across the street 
from the river owned all the way to the river. Um, and only since have those parcels been um, split off and built upon. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, we, we are a boat shop now and we are one of several boat shops like this that were uh, in existence along the riverbank here. Uh, and you'll see that in some later, some later maps. Um, but here is one of our one of our earlier photos, and and this is the actual property here that Simeon purchased. And so um, today I'm I'm talking to you from this building here. Uh, these two buildings still exist and comprise the main part of our um, current shop. And then um, over the years, several other ancillary outbuildings were built, um, fell in or knocked down rebuilt as other buildings, et cetera. And so it's been through several iterations, but the two main shops um, have remained pretty much all the way through. And this is the house that Simeon himself purchased with the shore property in 1793. So early on, Simeon wasn't building, we are, we are known as the birthplace of the Dory. And, uh, that is not what Simeon originally had been building. He'd been building uh, wherries and ships boats. And uh, when you get into some of these, the semantics of boats and boat designs and that kind of thing, especially Ben, it's really hard to know what exactly um, they're talking about. And this is, as far as I know, the oldest drawing of a wherry. And looking at this as a boat builder, it's hardly discernible as a boat. Um, I don't know who drew this, but it's, it's I, I wouldn't even know how to start building something like this. Um, so I'm basically going off a lot of uh, educated conjecture to try to determine what it was that uh, Simeon was building, but the, the wherries were very similar to a dory, we believe, um, just with a little bit more shape as this has to the sides. Um, and then a ship's boat was something more approaching what we maybe now call a, a Whitehall. Um, and those, the difference between the two was that the, the wherry had a single plank keel, um, relatively few overlapping planks to the side and were smaller. Um, and if you, if you look back at the old ledgers that we have, a, a wherry cost about a third to a quarter as much as a ship's boat. Um, so that would equate to uh, essentially an amount of work involved in constructing them. So the, the wherry was a much simpler kind of craft. Um, <clears throat> so we really start to see the word dory show up in, uh, in use in about 1814, 1815. Um, and the, the first dory that does show up in the ledger uh, was actually a, a pair of dories that were built for the Roxbury Mill Corporation. And uh, what it was is they, the, it was a speculative group that was uh, looking at the prospect of damming off Back Bay to make a tide mill. And the dories, uh, we suspect, were for sounding out the flats there in the Charles um, to determine where they were gonna build the mill dam out there. And, um, and then after that, the, the term dory came into much wider use. Uh, you start to see it more and more in the, uh, in the ledger, certainly as time goes on. And then you see uh, the word wary start to completely disappear. And so the first dories were uh, something like this. You can see uh, relative to a wary, the, the bottom has gotten a little bit wider. Uh, the sides themselves have gotten a little simpler with these knuckles. And really, uh, you know, we're talking 40 years post revolution. Um, and you have the, the forests, the wide pine forest being open up to exploitation, um, domestic exploitation. Uh, prior to that, they'd been the, the big pines had been the property of the king, um, but now we the commoners could use them, and we used them to build these wide plank boats. So uh, the, 
the fact that this boat has one, two, three, four, five planks to the side, probably a single plank bottom. Um, these were all required planks that were very, very wide and very long. Um, and luckily for us back then, they existed here in abundance. Um, but you're, what we're trying to do is trace the, uh, the development of the dory from the way in these two. Well, the early dories were round sided affairs, uh, mostly used for shore fishing. So places like Swampscott, um, the, the North Shore and, and even the South Shore of Massachusetts with uh, these big sandy beaches, you could take a flat bottom light boat, launch it through the surf and go fishing. And the most important part was being able to get back in through the surf, um, which the steeply raked uh, narrow transom, you could land this boat on a beach and the next wave that come up wouldn't slap the transom until the boat, um, it would lift it up and push it further up onto the beach. Um, and so these became uh, very popular along or for, for shore fishermen along the coast of Massachusetts um, and even up a little bit into New Hampshire and Maine. Graham, if I can just interrupt with our first question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Andrew's wondering where the terms Dory, Wary, and Whitehall come from, and if they indicate anything about the purpose. Um, we don't know. So the, the term Dory, uh, I, I have no idea where the, the origin of uh, that word comes from. Wary is a, originates in England. Um, so a Wary now is a, is a pretty fancy rowboat in England. Um, historically, I think if you, if you say ferry with a Cockney accent, you end up with wary. Um, and I think that's probably the, the origin of that term. And I think now it's just, it's come to mean all rowboat. Um, and it could be it could be any bit of slang, like a double wary became just a dory or something like that. And maybe it is that the, the bottom was double the width or something like that. Um, but that etymology that's lost to time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and a Whitehall is a particular design <clears throat> and that originates from, from uh, New York. So, uh, well, New York and, uh, and England, I suppose, but, uh, you know, Whitehall on the Thames. And I think, isn't, I think Whitehall was a landing down near South Street and these fast rowboats were developed for uh, getting out to the ships first to try to get their business before they got to the dock. Um, and that too became sort of an all encompassing term for a particular type of boat. And if I talk about a Whitehall, it doesn't mean one particular thing. It means a whole range of boats that have similar characteristics. Um, and it's, again, it's really difficult. Uh, the, what makes a dory a dory in particular is that the bottom is longitudinally planked, meaning it's planked fore and aft. And uh, it's pointy on both ends. The, the flat bottom is pointy on both ends. Um, and that, that is basically, that in the, it doesn't even have to have a transom. It can have two stems, but um, that defines a dory. And then there's a thing called a dory skiff, which uh, the bottom is more flat iron shaped. It's pointy at one end and has a flat on the other. Um, but the planks still run fore and aft. And then a proper skiff, the has a pointy bow and a flat stern and the planks run across on the bottom. And so there, there are all sorts of uh, different categories and subcategories of these things, but it's all based on the construction style and the, the characteristic. Um, so we, we've been talking about pre uh, mid 19th century and uh, really this place started to flourish after 1860. And 
what happened, the, the development of the dory and the development of Lowell's pretty closely follows the developments in the fishing industry. And what happened prior to 1850, 1860 was that uh, you would go out on your small fishing schooner, not unlike the, the photo I showed you earlier, <clears throat> with six, eight, 10 guys, and you'd go find a fishing spot, you would anchor and you would start to fish over the side. And fishing was pretty good to begin with. And then pretty quickly, you would have caught all the fish that were under the boat in that general area. And then you'd have to pull the anchor up, move somewhere else, start fishing again. Um, and it, it became inefficient as uh, the fish stocks started to deplete. Uh, one of the ways that they would find a new spot is while they were fishing, they would send, they, they always brought a small boat out with the big schooner, probably a wherry, and they would put a guy in the small boat and have him row to different spots away from the ship to find where the best fishing was. And then when he'd found it, they would move the whole big boat over there. Uh, and eventually he started to come back with a boat load of fish. And they got the idea that if uh, we could put everybody in their own boat, they could spread out even further and, and catch more fish. And so uh, the thought was that Hiram Lowell, who was the grandson of Simeon, uh, developed the bank dory, which could be stacked in banks on the deck of a schooner. So uh, basically what you had was a boat that took up a footprint on the deck of a ship and you could stack them four, five, six, eight high um, and take a lot out to sea with you, which was very important, especially as we needed to catch more fish to make the same amount of money, basically, and put in twice, three times, four times the effort to do that. And here we are back to uh, the evolution of the design. You've got your swamp skit dory here with your round sides. Um, you can't stack one of these efficiently inside another. Um, so what Hiram was said to have done was made the bottom wider, take the sides, make them straight, almost like uh, Russian nesting dolls. And then um, these, when you pull the seats out, these can be stacked one inside the next, inside the next. Um, and when he designed these, he designed them for the efficiency of, of use, certainly to be able to be stackable, but also uh, efficiency of construction. So uh, these require, there's, there's very little wastage of wood when you go to build one of these bank stories. And so uh, these shops that we're in now were built in 1860 uh, purposely as factories for building dories. And this, this was built by Hiram Lowell. Uh, this particular shop here was actually built by a separate company called Moreland Flanders. The Lowell's later purchased that building, uh, it was said that they actually moved it to the site and um, put it next to our current building and took the walls out and doubled the, the production space. But you can see in 1861, uh, they produced 180 dories, which is a lot of boats. Um, and you can see here, this is the later map. The earlier map was about 1850 that I showed you. This is about 1870. And uh, what had been a shipyard now is W.D. Lowell Boathouse, the Boat Shop, Hiram Lowell Boathouse, Morrill Boathouse, another Lowell um, here. Morrills have a boat shop there, um, another Morrill Boat Shop down there. So uh, business is starting to really boom here in the, in the dories. And you had, of course, you had lumber and you had a workforce in town that knew how to build these things. And so um, a lot of the labor would migrate from shop up and with them, obviously migrated the knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and it also became, you know, with these dories, they were mass producing them in factory fashion. And you didn't want to make dories that didn't fit in this guy's dory, because uh, if you got into buying that guy's dories, you had to keep buying his dories. So to remain competitive, everybody's dories had sort of uh, fit inside of each other. And so there was a lot of sharing of uh, patterns and in, in quote unquote technology um, back then. 
Uh, and then we, you know, 10 years later, you've got more boat houses, more boat shops popping up. Um, and this was a, this was a manufacturing center as well as uh, down river across the river from new report. Um, there were several boat shops down there that were producing, um, producing dories to factory numbers. And you can see here, um, in the, well, basically the 30 years between 1871 and 1897, um, our shop anyway, produced just shy of 900 dories a year. So they really streamlined the process and made it a, uh, a real production assembly line kind of uh, kind of deal to produce that many dories. And, you know, town was bustling as well. And it, again, this is more of an interesting photograph for people who, who live here, but uh, that little bridge right there is that little bridge right there. And if you look at the river today, you would not think about there being tugboats and uh, big three-masted coal schooners and lumber schooners floating by. But, you know, in the 1880s and 90s, it was, it was the norm. Um, and it really shows you the industrial landscape of this place. You know, you've got a factory building here. Um, that was a, a hat factory. This is a, um, a lumber yard. That's a coal wharf. Um, you know, all of these industries exist right here, right along the river. And there, you know, essentially no trees left. Um, a couple here and there have started to pop up, but uh, they pretty much cut the landscape clear by this by this time. Uh, and again, not too many photos uh, exist of this shop, the exterior of this shop, uh, prior to you know the the nineteen forties, and even fewer exist of the interior, which is really too bad. I would. I would kill for a set of photographs of the inside of this boat shop from you know the the 19th century, but um, to my knowledge, there aren't any that exist. Uh, partly because it was unremarkable. Uh, it was a a factory shape uh, factory space where they were producing boats. So just like today, if you were going to go to the the Boston Whaler factory, uh, you wouldn't necessarily be too interested in somebody. Uh, squirting fiberglass all over a mold, but um, it was commonplace back then, and it just happens to be uh, of historic interest to us now. Um, I also would like to show this to the kids for them to imagine, you know, the dirt road with the, the trolley tracks, um, horses and carriages and things that are certainly long gone by. Um, so not only was the dory business a good business, but also uh, around the latter half of the, or the, I guess the latter decades of the 19th century, uh, people started to use boats for recreational purposes. And uh, we designed these things called the Namesbury Skiff, which uses a lot of the same building methods um, and even a lot of the same patterns as one of the dories. And uh, you can see, this is the shop right here. This photo is taken just upriver, but the scene is one that you could see in in uh, many like photos of the time. Uh, and these were a very common sight. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those skiffs in this picture alone. Um, <clears throat> and for that previous uh, for that previous question, this is a, actually a pretty good juxtaposition. This here is a Whitehall. That's what I would consider a Whitehall uh, next to an Amesbury skiff, which is, um, you know, this might have eight or nine smooth planks on the side where this has three car or uh, three clinker planks. So it would take me eight times longer to build a boat like this than, than one of these. Um, and so, you know, with all of these shops producing all of these dories, uh, they would begin to stack up. This, this has to be a photo taken sometime in you know, late February or March. And you can see um, you know, these stacks of dories. There's probably eight to a stack here. And there's one, two, three, four, five stacks um, just right there. And that's not much. You know, those are just waiting for ice out probably to go to Gloucester um, or awaiting for 
a truck to come by to take him up to the railroad station, um, which was just up the hill. So <clears throat> um, I like to mine some of these old photos to look for where the dories were all stacked up because um, they must have been absolutely everywhere with four or five shops turning out each 800 boats a year. Um, and when we got into the, the early part of the 20th century was when we reached our production pinnacle. Um, in uh, 1911, we produced just over 2000 boats, which is unfathomable considering the space that we have here and um, the sheer size of a dory. And the way we did that was that town, remember I told you earlier, if you followed that powwow river up into town, there is a fall factory buildings. And those factories um, throughout the, the 19th century were building primarily carriages, horse-drawn carriages. And then uh, as the 20th century dawned and horseless carriages started to become a thing, many of those factories uh, transferred their production over to making uh, car bodies and things like that. So, you know, similar uh, to carriages, they had the, the labor and all the tooling and they could just start to make those. But a lot of the uh, side industries that were for the carriages, for the carriage production um, didn't have work anymore. And so they actually started to produce dory pieces for the boat shops along the river. And so the way uh, that we were able to produce 2000 boats was essentially, we were essentially uh, assembling them here and buying the pieces from, from factories downtown. Uh, and again, I'm a sucker for a photo with uh, a bunch of dories. And this one, uh, this is the, my most favorite photo that we have in our collection. And it's because, oh, it's funny, it doesn't, it's not a picture of the shop, but uh, Ralph Lowell, who was the last, the seventh and last generation in the family to own the shop uh, is standing right here at Salisbury Point uh, Station. And you can see 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50 dories on this train headed um, who knows where. Could have been to Gloucester, could have been even at this point to the West Coast. Um, our dories were being used uh, by lifeguards in California by this time. Uh, they were heavily used in Alaska for the fisheries um, and they were even being shipped worldwide. Um, there was around this time, there was a, a big shipment that went to Africa. Um, I forget what the reason was, but uh, the point is that they were being, they were being shipped out um, across the, across the world. Uh, well, and then we had a world war, you know, how that goes. And with the world war comes industrialization. And with industrialization, uh, the dory started to meet its demise. And uh, I stole this photo out of the old calendar. And the reason I like it is it's a transition period, certainly in the fisheries, uh, where you have here a fully sail schooner, fishing schooner, um, right next to a schooner that has a wheelhouse and a diesel engine installed um, next to a much smaller, uh, the mast is really here for show, um, all power uh, fishing boat. Still fishing with dories, still fishing with dories. Um, many of them are. But then when you get over to here, you see there's a net on the back of this boat. Um, so they're just starting to get into beam trawling or otter trawling as we know it today. And uh, that's what led to the real downfall of the dory and, uh, and really the, these precipitous slide um, uh, of our business away from building dories. Uh, we weren't the only place that, that had this issue. Um, this boat's still in Gloucester. This is the adventure. But again, this is what I'm talking about. The sails are really there uh, for steadying purposes, little else, and, um, and riding on the, in heavy weather on the banks, but they're still fishing out of these dories. So they're heading out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 14 dories um, headed out to go fishing. 
the other reason um, that I like this photograph, this is, I believe this photo was taken in the 50s, um, is that here, they used to fish out of the Boston Fish Pier. Uh, these are the flats in East Boston being turned into Logan Airport right across the way. So when you have a, you talk about, you know, anachronisms and all that, you know, you've got a, a fishing schooner headed out to put guys over the side in wooden dories right next to an airport being built for uh, airliners. But even when they fully mechanized the, the fishing boats, uh, they didn't give up their dories. So uh, whether by superstition or whether they actually needed them, uh, they still had them. And you can see, <laughs> you can see here, there's actually a life raft here too. Uh, these dories very rarely left their spot up there. And uh, when they were needed, oftentimes the bottoms were full, fully rotten and they couldn't be anyway. So uh, my guess is that's why that life raft is there. And this is probably around, someone can tell me by these cars, I'm not a car enthusiast, but this is probably uh, World War II era. And that's there in case you get torpedoed. But this shows a beam trawler. Um, they'd put the net over the side. They'd actually pull the net along from this gallows frame here and haul it up over the side. This may even be a scalloper. So what do we do when uh, the fishing industry doesn't need dories anymore? Well, we pivot to use uh, the parlance of our times now. And uh, so uh, what we, we had were people that knew how to build boats and do it well. And they took all of the old patterns and all the old methods and started to design pleasure craft for people. Uh, and so this uh, Palmer was a marine engine company down in Connecticut. Uh, they would order boats from us again, because we were a factory and we would ship them these boats. They would install their engines in it uh, and they'd sell them as a, as a Palmer lap strake fishing boat. Um, and we were doing that for a number of places, uh, basically as just a, a production boat shop. And, uh, you know, we started to basically turn slowly over the course of the, certainly the latter half of the 20th century, um, our production went over to recreational, essentially entirely. Um, here you've got mid-century again, uh, this is the time of uh, Logan Airport and the Schooner Adventure. Uh, we're still building, you know, dories. These are these are proper fishing dories. Uh, this gentleman's putting seats in what was called a punt. So these simple little boats were being built for Boy Scouts and Girl Scout camps, and uh, and we were trying to find business essentially anywhere we could. But really, uh, still in the fifties, all these boats were being built. Small boats anyway were being built out of wood and so uh, there was still plenty of business to go around to, to keep this place busy. But then uh, with the advent of fiberglass, fiberglass really took over the, the medium sized boat market before it took over the small boat market. But uh, really into the 1980s, we were building, uh, and I can tell you in about 1980, we built 75 boats, uh, which is still a pretty good number of boats. Um, but what you can see, here is that they have become fancy varnished uh, toys versus um, work boats. And this is Jim Modell. So Jim Modell bought the shop in the mid seventies from Ralph Lowell, who was a little boy in the, in the train photo that I showed you a few slides earlier. Uh, and Jim bought the shop with the, the goal of preserving it really. He saw the uh, the history and knew that he needed to, to save it. And so I'm fairly certain he had retired from a job in a bank and he employed his, his son anyway to work here and uh, a couple of the old timers. And he essentially lost money every year trying to run this place until he could get it listed as a national historic landmark, uh, which was done in, in 1991. Uh, so, you know, this is us today as a national historic landmark. We are a, a working museum now. So we're, as you'll see in a minute when we go walking around, uh, we're still building boats for people uh, as we always have. And the uh, boats that uh, if they aren't the same, they are quite similar to the boats that were 
built here historically. Um, and as I said, we're a national historic landmark. Uh, and so as a working museum, we have a static history museum for people to get, uh, again, acquainted with our, our long history. And then on the main floor of the shop, we are, we're still building boats for customers, which is um, as interesting, if not more interesting to visitors than the, the history museum. We also hold a bunch of uh, school programs trying to get tools in kids' hands, which we're pretty successful with. Um, we teach a, a math course using sextants. Um, we bring kids out in the, in the dories with sextants, not to do sun sights, but to use the, um, the sextants to learn, uh, or at least reinforce their, uh, their trig lessons. Uh, we've got a lot of summer camps and a lot of adult programs. We run uh, boat building programs and, and similar type things for adults. Uh, in the summer, we, we have a fleet of dories that we uh, get kids out in the river in to explore. And we have uh, an apprentice program for high schoolers and they're, they'll be getting here in about a half an hour. But uh, we, we've got 10 or 15 high school kids that show up after school uh, during the winter to, to basically learn how to do this. So our mission is to preserve and perpetuate the art and craft of wooden boat building um, in the Lowell tradition. And the best way of doing that is to teach young people how to do it, uh, teach as many people how to do it really. But it originated with this project here uh, in 2012, we built a, a whale boat for Mystic Seaport and, uh, and the Charles W. Morgan with uh, apprentices. Uh, this past year, we, or over the past several years, I suppose, we, we rebuilt um, a shallop for Plymouth Plantation. So this is uh, a replica of the shallop that was brought over on the Mayflower um, with the pilgrims that they <clears throat> assembled on the beach in Provincetown um, and then used to explore the coast and eventually find Plymouth before the, the Mayflower, um, going back and getting the Mayflower. Let me see if I can make this work. I told them I wasn't gonna do a video, but uh, I guess I can't make it work. You oh, there it goes. Yeah. There it Is goes. there sound on this video? Maybe, I don't know. It's <laughs> only a couple seconds, but uh, this, was, this was this past spring when we, um, when we launched it. This is, a, this is one of our apprentices. So um, a fairly big vessel for the shop to do. Um, and hopefully we'll be doing a similarly sized boat this winter um, or over the next couple of winters with the apprentices. But you can see this shallop now down in Plymouth uh, next to the Mayflower. And so using you know, a project like this to teach youth is about the best thing we can do because you, know, you can have them build a boat, but if the boat doesn't serve any purpose, uh, the buy-in isn't nearly as great as if you're working on this boat for another institution like our own, um, who's going to use it for educational purposes. Uh, and so the kids can, can rally around that and rally around, you know, doing something with meaning. And that is the, the briefest of overviews of who we are and what we do. Uh, and I can I can take some questions now, and then I'm I'm going to take you out, show you what the place looks like. It's not nearly as clean as this photo would tell you. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. That was an awesome presentation. Um, just a reminder to everyone that you can type your questions into the chat, and we'll read them out for you. Um, Andrew, earlier while we were talking about the White Halls, asked if the wine glass transom is a key characteristic. It is a key characteristic of a Whitehall, yes. Uh, the defining or one of the defining characteristics of a dory is the quote unquote uh, tombstone transom, which is a, a triangular transom. And I stopped short of saying that earlier because uh, a dory can have a stem on either end as well and still be a dory. So it's, uh, it's one of those semantic things that uh, <clears throat> that you can get into, but the the wine glass 
transom of a white hall and the shape that that creates uh, makes them a complicated thing to build. And that is what Simeon was building here, something similar anyway. Um, they cost four times as much as wary. And it's the, that, that complication um, that that introduces into the process. All right, well, why don't you go ahead uh, and stop the screen share and take us on the move? Uh, okay, there's my computer. So why don't you focus on me now on my phone. If we can shift over that. Do I screen share this? Maybe I do. I don't have Where do we see you. You got me? Okay. Yep. I'm gonna turn this thing around so you aren't looking at my face. If I can figure out there it is. So I'm currently in our office. We're just whittling away at uh, paperwork. Paperwork. Um, ooh, Christmas. So this office was added by uh, Ralph Lowell, uh, when he came back from World War II, uh, there had been a building just next door and um, he was taking over the shop. He was a young man and basically taking over for his uncle um, and wanted a place to do business. And that was it. Oh, wow. It is clean. It's changed in the last half an hour. So <laughs> this is our main uh, building floor and uh, the the production process or the assembly line process would start here. Um, you can see the road is immediately there and there's Simeon's old house. Um, <clears throat> and up above us was where the storage was of lumber and uh, the pre-made dory pieces. And so you open the hatch and you call up for whatever uh, boat you're about to build and they'll hand the pieces down. And then you'd nail uh, you'd nail that together in this general area and then move to the building bed here, uh, which you can see is empty. We're just starting our, our winter projects. Um, and you would set up your dory here and by setting up, we don't have any current, currently set up, do we? No. Um, you'd take the, the bottom with the frames attached, you'd put it on the bed here um, and then you brace it down from the ceiling. And then um, that clamp there clamps the stem so that it's plumb while you build. And history says that you can't quite see it through the, through the doors there because someone planted a tree, but the corner of Simeon's house is right across the street. And you can line the stem and the transom up with the corner of Simeon's house um, for plumb. And I've got to say that after, I mean, that house was built in what, the 1740s. So uh, what's my math? 280 years, it's still pretty darn plumb. Uh, and so this is where the boats would be planked. And then once planked, they would move to the back of the assembly line here, right by the river. You can see the rivers right outside. Um, there's our waterfront with our boats. Um, and this is where you'd get uh, seats and rails and, and all that finishing work. Um, and the whole building itself is our, our artifact. So the, every time I look around, I see uh, things that I have not seen before. So one such thing is uh, you'll see the overhead here is all chewed up. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, the old way of clamping, you take a stick with a nail on the end of it you'd stick it up into basically clamp your piece of work to the bench or to the boat or whatever and so um you know this whole this whole building's just been chewn up and there are some new planks here because they worked through some of the old ones um and i only noticed that maybe five or six years ago uh and then there's a better rendition of that picture that i just showed you they'd go out a door here down to the deck and then come back inside uh, down below where I'll take you now. And then we'll, we'll come back up and look at other projects. But, uh, and I said before too that um, 
This is the Hiram Lowell boat shop. This is the Morrill and Flanders boat shop. Uh, and when they joined them, they stuck them together a couple feet apart and you've got exterior siding, exterior siding and the, the stairway in between. Um, um, utilize that for, and the tide's low right now, but at high tide, you'd see water down there. And uh, that was the, the flushing system. So uh, we talked about them dropping those boats down to the deck outside. They would then wheel them in here uh, and paint them. And so the, the painting process most by the door um, and the paint they would produce, at least in the early years, they would produce themselves. Uh, the main ingredient being that with uh, some, uh, not, not pine tar, but uh, linseed oil and some thinner. Um, and they'd mix it in a barrel that stood there. Uh, well, it's been not dry for about 150 years. Um, so much so that I'm willing to bet, see this piece here is stuck into it. So on the hot days in the summer, um, you can actually depress your finger into this because uh, it's just not dry. It's also almost entirely lead. In some places, it's uh, you know four or five inches thick over here where they used to clean their brushes on the um, on this old chimney. And they they'd actually you can see there's not much here now. Uh, on a hot day about three years ago, this whole thing just peeled right off and this was wet paint underneath. Um, and so uh, all of you are welcome to come visit us because we are a museum and we are open to the public. We're a little less open than we had to, been pre-COVID, um, but we're starting to improve. We have a collection that sort of follow our history. Let's get Dory that I was showing you pictures of. Um, it really didn't change for a couple of the same boat with a class up in Maine um, earlier this month. And then the development into the stackable uh, bank story here. Was the, the fishing industry for uh, you know the recreational side of things? But I, I talked about uh, the boat being set up on a bed. So here is essentially a, a dory skillet institution. Uh, there's a lot. A lot of math in the process of building that um, you might uh, notice. And one of the genius things that they did was you can see this brace from the ceiling down to the bottom. Part of the process of setting this boat up to build it is to get the bottom uh, sprung down to the building bed because it's got uh, curvature fore and aft. Uh, that is that uh, that brace is essentially an isosceles triangle. You brace the boat down and uh, then you can either knock, which is very simple geometry, not be obvious to a kid until you show them. And then this is a <clears throat> picture of the the shop, the piecework being done upstairs, the, the bottoms and the frame um, off to be used. Um, and again, recreational things. So this is a uh, one of those skiffs that I was showing you in these photographs of the, the rusticators. Um, and these things still exist. So because they were recreational boats, a lot of times they found their way uh, into the barn and you know haven't been used for a hundred years. And, and every couple of years, somebody shows up with one that's 
um, 80 or 100 years old. Um, and then uh, we move into the modern era and forgive us for this place is always a mess because it's a it's a working shop as well as a museum but um, <clears throat> You know, this particular boat here is a 100 year old power dory. And one of the first things they did when the marine engines were developed was they put them in dories because they were uh, cheap and available, but they don't lend themselves to uh, power conversion because there's very little boat. Uh, I say that the, the boat's so cut away back aft that uh, tends to squat under the weight of that engine. Uh, and so they worked well enough. The um, the quote unquote Guinea fleet in Boston used power dories quite a bit um, to fish among the, the islands. They you know, zoom out in the morning, um, the day fishermen, and zoom back. And uh, this is one of those Palmer skiffs that I showed you that we, uh, we built many, many, many of these uh, through the 40s and 50s for the, for the Palmer engine company. Um, and then if you guys are all in your offices, I'll take you outside and show you the, the beautiful, the beautiful day. Um, and then. Hey, Johnny. You're, you're talking to the world, so watch your mouth. <laughs> and then uh, this is our paint room where this is a, a classic uh dory of the the type that we build today you can see a lot of varnish um a sail rig it's all very shiny it's all very uh perfect and so it takes a long time to do these and they uh the expense reflects it although uh they aren't as pricey as they ought to be and that's just because you can only charge so much for a little wooden boat Let me know if you start to lose me. It's a bit choppy, but okay. um, the, when you move your camera slower, um, Zoom can keep up a bit better. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also transitioning from Wi-Fi probably to cellular, so it might get a little choppy. We'll walk down and have a look here back at the shop and then uh, and we'll call it a day. Turned into a lovely day. Um, and so this is the, the mighty Merrimack now. And these are, this is our modern day Amesbury skiff. So uh, that Palmer skiff that I was showing you earlier with the inboard, uh, they redesigned for an outboard sometime in the 60s. And um, again, built scores hundreds of these things really um, throughout the centuries or throughout the, the last decades not centuries <laughs> this is uh one of our program boats this was built by our apprentice program uh, a few years ago um, as have been a couple of those dories there um, and that is your that is your view of lowell's boat shop so as you can see it's a lovely place um, fascinating and would be happy to spend more time with anyone who chose to come visit us. We're, we're pretty easy to come see. Um, and our, our visitor hours are slightly limited, but uh, you can schedule a visit anytime just by emailing us. Yeah, so, and, um, Graham, what's the email? I'll, I'll put it in the chat for everyone. It's just info at lowellsboatshop.com. Great. Um, thanks for those who are still with us. Graham, we had a couple of questions that trickled in on our little okay. tour. Um, yeah. Michael asked, are you now challenged making dories as originally designed with lumber of quality, length, et cetera, um, now harder to obtain? Um, yes and no. So we're still able to get good lumber. We just have to hunt for it more than they ever did. Um, and uh, we don't, sometimes we don't have to hunt that far. So if you look here in the yard, those are actually black locust trees. This whole hillside was all black locusts. Um, and 
over the years, several of the neighbors have, have taken a lot of those trees down, which we've milled up and used. Um, it's some of the best wood, hardwood that you can use in these boats. Um, the pine, we have to, we have deals with local mills and when they get a good tree, um, they will mill it and uh, put it aside for us. So uh, it takes a little bit of work, but uh, it's not impossible. Um, and really where they used to use extraordinarily wide boards for these things, we really don't need anything much over 12 inches to build one of these doors. The hardest part is try to find the, the stock for the oak rails, which needs to be maybe 20 or 22 feet in length. Uh, but I have a number of, of, I guess, friends that do big ship work. So stuff like the Mayflower, uh, stuff like the Adventure, and uh, they'll keep the planking off cuts for me, which are sometimes 24 or 25 feet long. Um, so again, it's just a little bit more work than it ever used to be. Got it. Um, and then our last question, if anyone that's still sticking with us wants to put a question in the chat, now's the time. Um, Paul asked, is the bending done, is all the bending done without a steam box? Uh, a steam box is not required for any of this. And the, the reason for that is that, again, you're building production boats and that steam box would only be uh, time and money. So uh, when you look at these dories, the planking on them is 9 16 And uh, the reason for that is that 5 8 will not make the bend around the frame. So they kept the planks as thick as they could, uh, but still make the bend without steaming. Uh, and that's the case with, with any of the pieces of wood on this. Uh, we do use steam here on occasion for different boat repairs, but uh, for building any of the boats that we normally build, we don't need any steam at all. Well, all right. Well, with that, um, thank you so much, Grams, for this fantastic talk. I yeah, love of that course. You got to take us outside to see this beautiful day. Um, as Andrew said, we are definitely jealous of your work. <laughs> On my view, right? Yeah. Um, Out the window. Thank you so much. Uh, this talk has been recorded, so we're going to upload it to our YouTube channel where you can check it out later. And um, I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you all. Thank you.